The revolution will be individualized. This is TK Coleman, and I'm with my brother Kamau. Today, we're going to be talking about the life and legacy of the late and legendary brother Tupac. What's happening, Kamau? Hey, what's up, man? I um, I suggested uh, we talk about Tupac because we've talked a good bit about you know revolutionaries from um, you know the '50s, '60s, '70s, '80s civil rights era. Um, and I think Tupac was maybe a trailblazer of this new generation of revolutionaries, um, who, who used music and creativity as, as a vessel for his messages and, uh, for the things that he stood for. And, you know, for a lot of people who like hip hop, a lot of people who like pop, who, who like R and B, I mean, this guy, Till date is arguably the greatest uh, recording artist in those genres alive. I mean, uh, not alive, but ever. Uh, he he is in a lot of people's eyes the goat when it comes to uh, rap. When it comes to um, you know a musician who had values and who stood for something, and you know whose music was more than just you know, the basic things, sex, drug, money, like his music had so much more substance and really impacted the lives of uh, millions of people. So I, I think this is going to be a good one. I think he is somebody who you don't really hear um, talked about in a positive light, right? He's only, he's most associated with his thug life narrative and, you know, the, the, the life of violent crime that he was involved in. But, um, you know, he he was a revolutionary nonetheless. He had ideas that that shook up the world, that shook up the table um, and that really left a lasting impact and legacy. Yeah, you know, when I grew up, Bob Marley was the guy that the older folks talked about as like that musical philosopher, philosophical musician guy. And yeah. there was yeah. an almost like uh, iconic status that he had in in the aftermath of his death and 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 so many people quoted him so many people um aspired to be like him and to to work out the implications of of the philosophy he espoused in his music and having come up in the era of Tupac watching his journey and 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 remembering exactly where I was when I heard about his his death and Watching the way the world responded to who he was as a person and what he stood for after he died, it makes me feel like that's my generation's Bob Marley, at least in black communities. I, th I think more people outside of black communities embraced Bob Marley. I think we see a little bit of that with Pac, but at least in black communities, there was this real genuine interest in understanding his brother's life and and really investigating at a deep level a lot of the things that he was getting at when he was writing. And and, and I, I think it's kind of cool to see that Tupac's reputation as a true poet, as a true philosopher, kind of emerging and standing the test of time. And it's it's funny to think that, well, now I'm the, I'm the older generation. And what Tupac is to my generation is in many ways what Bob Marley was to the generation of older folks, because he's not even new school. It's been a long time. It's been a real long yeah. time. Like we really yeah. talking about yeah. hip hop history and and, and 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 black history here in a big way. So I'm excited about it, man. I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. Yeah. Cool. Well, I want to dive right in and, and just kind of share some notable facts. I think <clears throat> again, a lot of people have a certain narrative of Tupac, but just to provide some context for our conversation, I wanted to share um, some little factoids about his life. So uh, a lot of people know that Tupac. His mother was actually pregnant while um, she was well, she was in prison while she was pregnant. That's uh, pretty well known about him and, and kind of his journey into this world. And what I wanted to share about that is that his parents were both a part of the Black Panther parties in the 60s and the 70s. And, you know, on our I think this was the vanguard of the revolution. Part two, we talked about um how at that time the FBI was, you know, they made it a point to, 
to to really you know dismantle a lot of these Black Panther uh, chapters that were across the United States, and uh, his parents were in one of the chapters in New York, and so um, his mother was actually on trial for more than 150 charges of conspiracy against the United States government and New York landmarks. Um, but a month before she gave birth to Tupac was acquitted of all 150 charges. Um, again, her, along with many, many others um, who went to jail, you know, who were part of that Black Panther Party chapter, they, they all faced similar charges. And so it was a huge deal when they got acquitted. But you know, just the fact that she was in jail, you know, five months out of her pregnancy um, is it kind of sets the tone of, of the life that he went on to uh, lead and and the struggles that he faced early on. Uh, another thing that I thought was really cool about Tupac was that his mother um, renamed him at the age of one. He was born Lassane Parrish uh, Crooks. And was later named um, Tupac Shakur, and he was named after after a uh, revolutionary um, who was executed in Peru after his failed revolt against the Spanish ruler. And so, his mother had something to say about why she uh, renamed him, and and it went something along the lines of, "I wanted him to have a name of a revolutionary." I wanted him to know that he was a part of a world culture and he wasn't just from some neighborhood. I thought that was really powerful. You know, on this show, we've, we've talked about, you know, there, there's power in names that, you know, whether uh, it's the name of a person or um, like Sean Dove came on and he talked about the uh, campaign for black male achievement and how it was really important for him to change the name and, and set the intention uh, in the beginning. And I, I think there's a lot of power when it comes to naming something. You know, I, I have a really unique name. Um, and I've often asked my parents, like, why? <laughs> why? Why did you have to do this to me? Why? Why did you make it so difficult um, for for people to pronounce my name? Like why every time I uh, have a roll call or, or some kind of roster check in and people are calling down names like why do I have to experience a level of anxiety and uh, you know it, it really can't, comes back to the meaning of names and and my parents for me wanted wanted me to have a compass they, they thought of my name as a compass that it's not uh, it's not just you know the comp the complexity of your name but it, it's the meaning of it and throughout your life if you ever get lost you, you know your name should serve as a compass to kind of guide you back to your true purpose and 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 really what your identity is. And so, I, you know, it, it was just interesting that that Tupac's mother wanted him to have a revolutionary name. Um, and and that kind of says a lot about his upbringing. Yeah, man, that, that I mean, you just went into it a little bit, but it reminds me of there is um, a podcast episode done in the studio a couple of years ago now where your mother told her story, talked about her entrepreneurial journey, and she said expressed all similar sentiments about naming you and just how important it was to get that right and to make sure that she did not approach this process of using a name as a mere label, as a mere reference point, but that it was an act of spiritual impartation. And I, I believe uh, Tupac's mother was, was part of the Black Panthers, and so she came from a culture where people took words very seriously. They understood that words have revolutionary power. I mean, that was the, we, we just did a, a few episodes back, we did a two-parter on, on the Black Panthers. And so she understood that very powerfully. And we see that a lot, man, in black cultures. I think a lot of times people just dismiss our names as folks just out here just trying to come up with something different. But... <laughs> The creativity and eccentricity that we put into naming our children has a lot of spirituality behind it. I know for me, I go by TK, uh, and that's not to protect people from the difficulty of pronouncing my name. I have no problem with that. But a number of my black friends in college, they used to call me TKO, and that got reduced to TK. So it's just kind of an, an, an endearing nickname. But my mom named me Tekoa, Tekoa La Prince. And... That word Tekoa means firm foundation. And it was made to made clear to me very early on that if you want to go high in life, 
you don't just want to focus on where you want to be, but you want to focus on laying foundations that are deep. The buildings that are the sturdiest, the buildings that are able to go up the most highest are the ones that spend a lot of time doing the groundwork, making deep, sturdy foundations so that it can sustain a lot of weight. And my mother prioritized that with me. And that's an aspect of my personality that's real. So make of it what you want, but there's a lot of meaning in the name. And even at a colloquial level, what we call people, when we when we tell people that mm. they're stupid, when we tell people like, hey, you know, uh, you're a complete idiot. We got to be careful the way we talk to our children, man. We got to be careful the way we talk to our young people because they internalize the names and labels that we assign to them. And then they begin to live it out, you know. And I, I think this is just a great example of how why parenthood is so important and, and why addressing our children with respect from the very beginning, teaching them that they're powerful beings is such a key part of this whole revolution of one philosophy we talk about. Yeah. And I think the identity piece is big. Like you said, you know, when, when you give somebody uh, their identity, I think, you know, as, as a child, you're trusting that your parents are looking out for you, you know, that you're they they're the ones that you can trust. They they're the ones that have your best interests in mind. And so, you know, those words that you give to them uh, to, to help them figure out their identity, whether they're nicknames, whether they're their real names, whether uh, they're just adjectives you know, that they hold on to that. And and I think that helps direct their identity because I think even as adults, you know, especially um, around like late teens, early 20s, it, it, I was still trying to figure out my identity. Um, I mean, even to this day, like I'm still learning more about my history and, and seeing how that associates, you know, with my identity, how that informs me to move forward. But, you know, that that foundation really is laid at home by your loved ones. Yeah, 100%, man. Well, let's dive into some of these. Uh, we, oh, I'm sorry, did I, did I cut you off? Well, I, I just wanted to couple, cover a few more points um, that were, were interesting. And then, yeah. Um, so real quick, I, I wanted to say that uh, what was interesting about Tupac, you know, obviously he, 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 was, he was a rapper, but he was also an actor. He was also a creative um, he, he did a lot of things. He was involved in theater really early on um, in middle school and high school. He, he deeply studied the works of Shakespeare and, th and that came through um, in his life and, and through some of his music and acting roles. Um, Study ballet. Was also too. interesting. Yeah. Studied ballet, too. Um, while he was in prison, he was uh, heavily influenced by the works of um, Machiavelli and uh, I think it's Niccolo. Is that how you pronounce it? I believe, man. And, and, but you know me. And I think names. it is. I think. <laughs> so uh, he actually later on in his life uh, took took on that uh, that stage name Machiavelli and, and was really just influenced by uh, the works of you know a lot of great thinkers, philosophers, creatives um, during his time. And um, just one thing about his music before we we, we close out here. Um, was that, you know, during the time he was alive, he, he recorded three, three hit albums. Um, and then after he died, um, his label and producers released five more albums after his death. So he had a huge body of work. Um, and when he died, he was only 25 years old. So it's just crazy how much ground he was able to cover. And all of his albums have been now are now certified platinum. So not only were they, you know, just um, just a big body of work, but, you know, he had hit after hit after hit after hit after hit. And, you know, that that's why he's kind of labeled uh, one of the greatest rappers, the greatest artists of all times, because he had such an impact and he he was able to do so much in so little time. So, yeah, without further ado, we can uh, we can roll whenever you're ready. Yeah, man, I love it. I think that's real good background. Ar already paints an interesting picture of him, a much more holistic one than most people associate with him just by listening to the music and knowing that he's a rapper. Um, he was a living example of good game peeps all game, which is uh, something that we talk about a lot here. So let let let's dive into uh, to number one. Death is not the greatest loss in life. 
The greatest loss is what dies inside while still alive. Never surrender. Tupac Shakur. There is um, a talk that Ram Das gave maybe about 40 years ago at a hospice facility called Death is Not an Outrage. And he talked about our tendency to look at people's legacies as being compromised when they die young and evaluating people on the basis of how they died rather than on how they lived and not dismissing someone's life because they died in a tragic way, but understanding that the worth of a person's life is reflected in the way they gave themselves over to whatever their mission was when they were alive. Dr. Miles Monroe, another hero of mine who died tragically and early, said that the richest place in the world is the cemetery because so many dreams are buried there. So many business ideas, so many unwritten songs, so many unwritten novels, they all get buried with the creators. And most people never allow what's inside of them to come forth during their lifetime. And he says the goal of life is to die empty, to take nothing with you, so that by the time you get to the cemetery, the grave looks at you and says, what do I want this guy for? He has nothing in him because he gave it all up in the course of his life. And Tupac's quote reminds me of, of both of those both of those stories and insights that none of us know when that day is going to come where we die. And obviously for him and his tragic death, he, he clearly didn't know. And we might find ourselves dying in the middle of making some pretty big, awesome plans. But I think what the life of Tupac illustrates is that you can live in such a way so that even if you die young, you can create a legacy that will not only have people talking about you long beyond your years, but that will have people dreaming bigger than they would have otherwise dreamed. So I just love that thought, man. Yeah, I, I think for me, what, what the quote really speaks to is that, you know, I think there there's two types of death. There's the physical death and then there is we can call it like the internal death uh, and, and the internal death, I, I, I think, is the death of um, faith. It's the death of hope. It's the death of motivation. It's the death of all the things that drive you to become the best version of yourself. We it's easy to kind of look at death and to think that, you know, as long as I'm breathing, um, I'm still alive. But I think Tupac's point here is that. Is, is, is just to get you to question, like, are you actually living? Because there's a lot of people who are just existing for the sake of, you know, existing. They're, they're not moving closer to any kind of higher version of themselves. They're not pursuing creativity. They're not living um, with intention, with vigor. And I, I, I think that really speaks to what we talk about is, is that, you know, that this is a, this is a journey. This, you know, you're listening to this because you are trying to, to, to revolutionize your life. You're trying to figure out, you know, what can I do? What can I say? What, what, what can I create that that's going to make a change that not only, um, changes my life in such a dramatic way and changes my thoughts and, and changes my intentions and, and, and really makes me wake up to my inner freedom and, and allows me to pursue that. But then that also gets to change the world. And I think once you recognize that life isn't, you don't just get to live life because you're breathing, but you, you live life based off of the things you do. I, I think that becomes a little bit more clear. You become a little bit more clear on like what the mission is. The mission isn't just uh, to clock in, clock out, um, to go home, to watch TV, you know, to rinse and repeat. Like the mission is to live intentionally, is to, is to create and, and it's to challenge yourself. I think, you know, a life with no challenge, with no risk, with with no um, with no obstacles is, is a life that that is wasted, you know, that, like life 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 isn't perfect. It, it it has all the ebbs and flows. It has all, all you know, the exciting and um, the ugly parts. But if, if you don't embrace it, I, I think you, you are prematurely 
um, killing yourself. You know, you're, you're prematurely uh, killing your potential to, to really make the best out of the situation. You know, when I think about Tupac's story as it relates to that, one of the things that jumps out to me is there was never a shortage of people who tried to make that brother feel guilty for being Tupac. I, I don't remember all the details. I'll have to go and find it. And, and maybe the clip will be worth um, sharing in a future episode. But I, I remember watching this um, panel discussion. Man, I wish I could remember who the host was. But there was a panel discussion with a number of different rappers at the time and a number of different people that had a lot of problems with rappers, right? And the way that they were framing the discussion, the way that they were stereotyping rap and black culture, they, they were trying to impose this moral responsibility on Tupac to talk the way they wanted him to talk, to rap about what they wanted him to rap about. And if he refused to do that, they wanted to make it very clear that we're going to make you feel guilty for it. And just watching his, I, I'll call it sacred stubbornness in those moments. Like, you're not going to have the power to define who I am. You are not going to tell me where I'm from and what I'm here to do or how I'm going to go about doing it. You have the right to disagree. You have the right to turn off the radio and not listen to me. But you are not going to sit here and tell me who I am and try to make me feel guilty because I'm not something other than who I'm choosing to be. And that level of conviction is such a critical part of dying before you die. It's such a critical part of living in such a way that you die empty because one of the main things that hold us back is a fear of being frowned on, a fear of being rejected, mm -hmm. a fear of being thought of as a bad guy. And I think the way that Tupac dealt with the whole role model thing leaves a lot to be learned because I, I think the desire to have other people think of us as, oh, he's a nice guy. The desire to have other people say, I really like him. That that gets at this fundamental need that we all have to feel validated. But in order to do great things, you have to be willing to even give that up. You have to be willing to even move in a direction where some of the people who might say, he's a nice guy. I really like him. <laughs> might fold their arms and pout and say, well, I disagree. And I don't think he should use his money that way. I don't think he should use his platform or his influence that way. And you just got to keep moving. You know, if you don't have the willingness or ability to go there for at least one of your convictions in life, you will never live. Mm. Man, that's so powerful. Um, it's it's scary, you know, and and I think I, I really like the, the whole notion of sacred uh, stubbornness, because I, I think on from the outside, it, it really feels like, you know, somebody's they might be being selfish. They might be you know, they, they might be thought of as being reckless, um, careless, you know, even dangerous, like, all, you know, there's a ton of labels that you could put on somebody when they're, they're standing strong in who they are and, and what they're about, even, even if it does seem, you know, dangerous or reckless or what whatever the case may be. I mean, there's, there's something about, you know, standing firm in who you are and, and, and it's, I think you could label it as confidence. You could label it as, you know, whatever you want. But if you really are called to do it, then nobody's going to understand. Like if, if you really feel like you're in alignment, even if it, if it's, it, if it's not nice or if it's not about the mainstream narrative, if you're creating from that highest level where you're just tapped in and, you know, it's just flowing from you, it feels natural, it feels organic and it feels right, then it's kind of one of those things that if you allow yourself to be persuaded in another direction, then I think you are sacrificing that uh, sacredness that you, you know, to, to your essence of creativity. Like you're sacrificing that if you're allowed to be persuaded to be something that you're not. Yeah. For anybody that's listening that might feel like, well, hey, what if I'm not a controversial person? What if I don't like being controversial? What if that's just not my style to be provocative and disagreeable? And I say, that's fine if you're looking at being provocative and disagreeable and controversial as 
a description that you give to your own character. But that has nothing to do with the fact that other people are going to slap those labels on you to describe areas where your philosophy and your approach to life conflicts with theirs. And that will happen no matter who you are. And so you might think that you're not provocative. You might think that you're very agreeable. You might think that you're so uncontroversial as to be boring. But there are people out there who disagree with the way you come down on certain positions in life. And they will put that label on you. So it's not about the labels we use to describe ourselves. It's about how we deal with the labels that other people seek to assign to us. And so the question that you have to always be ready to answer is, do I have the courage to be disliked? Am I willing to be mm. disliked for the things that I believe in? And even if I believe my beliefs are uncontroversial, what happens if the world changes in such a way so that it becomes controversial? Am I willing to persist in my convictions then, even when I'm hated for them? Let's go to number two. A coward dies a thousand times. A soldier dies but once. You know, I just wanted to say real quick, th this is a tough one, actually. Uh, I, I picked this one because I think there's a lot of different directions you could take it. And I was really curious to see, you know, what this meant to you, because um, in a way it's 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 a little cryptic, too. You know, um, a coward dies a thousand times, but a soldier dies only once. What does that what does that say to you? If I'm being honest. I think back to all the times in my life where I made soft, self-compromising choices just to get along with people, just to avoid being criticized, just to avoid getting in trouble, just to avoid stirring the pot. And every single one of those times where I have done that, I felt a little piece of myself die. I felt a little bit of my fire go out. I felt just a little bit of that self-authenticity diminish. And the most dangerous thing about that is you can actually live with that because it's not that bad. And it reminds me of the fact that selling your soul is rarely, if ever, a one-time event. When you look at people who sell their soul, they are people who died a thousand deaths through small little acts of cowardice multiplied over time. They say yes when they really want to say no because they don't want to be thought of as a mean person. They go along with things without protesting and saying, I don't think that's a good idea because they don't want anybody to think that they are the weak link in a chain that they never wanted to be a part of in the first place. And so when I think of a soldier as somebody who dies only once, the way I hear that is, if you are willing to stand up and fight for what you truly believe in, then the only time you have to die is the day that God appoints your death. On the other hand, if you compromise yourself in order to avoid conflict, then every single day you're going you're gonna to experience a whole bunch of little moments of death to your soul, death to your joy, death to your self-respect. And that's the price you have to pay for being a coward. The most important question I ever asked myself in life is, who are you becoming in the process of making this choice? And once I start thinking about my choices, not so much in terms of a hey, who's going to respect me or how much will I get paid or how much conflict will I avoid or how happy will I be in the short term? And I started asking myself, who am I going to become in the process of doing this kind of work, moving in this kind of direction? being around these kind of people. And if I don't like the answer to who I'm going to become in five months, five years, as a result of doing that, I don't want anything to do with it, even if you offer me the world, because that's what selling your soul looks like. I don't want to die the thousand deaths of a coward, man. I want to stand up and fight like a soldier and only die when my day comes. I'm speechless. I mean, that that's so real. Um because I, I, I think everybody can relate and I'll just speak for myself. I, I know I can relate. Um, I, I know that I've compromised, you know, what I want and, and not necessarily in a selfish way, but really what I believe, 
like what 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 I wanted to say, um, but chose not to. And and I've done that <laughs> many times. Um, and and what what's funny about looking back and thinking about <clears throat> thinking about where life where life ends up placing you when you when you do that kind of self compromising thing really you look back and it's like i've just wasted all these years because you find yourself in the same place feeling the same kinds of things the same kinds of belief and then looking back and thinking like i should have just you know what what if i would have just stood by my belief like where would my life be now what could could things have moved in a different direction like what would have happened if i would have just put myself through that moment of comfort and just push through it. You know, what, what, what does freedom look like on the other side of that? Um, whereas now, you know, I'm, I I can only be in the present moment, but I still feel the same things. Like my, my convictions necessarily haven't changed just because I was agreeable at the moment and I didn't go with, you know, whatever my gut or intuition or whatever I was called to go with. I didn't go with it. That that calling doesn't go away. I mean, it it's a weaker now. I don't feel um, as like strong in that opinion, but it, my mind hasn't changed about it. Just maybe my circumstances and the situation have. And I, I I think really, what it comes down to is a choice. It, it's always a choice. Um, but there's definitely there's, I'd say over the last couple of years, there's definitely been more um, of an emphasis of like you can't continue to do that. Um, time is only going to pass, you know, opportunities are only going to pass. But I think uh, at least for somebody who, you know, may be struggling out there with this same instance, the same kind of experience, what's worked for me is just the power of momentum. You know, once you start saying yes, once you start standing by some of those convictions, it becomes easier to continue to do that. Um, just momentum also, it works in both ways, right? Like if you continue to say, um, you know, no to your convictions and you, you continue to be agreeable, it becomes harder and harder, uh, to turn that around. And, you know, years can go by decades can go by and you look back and you're 50 or 60 and you're just like, you know, I, what did I do with my life? Um, but on the other side of that, there, there's always a choice. You always have a choice and, to the degree that you're able to choose yourself, to choose your convictions, to choose your beliefs. And, you know, you, you do it once and then you do it again and then you do it again. And you kind of just start to lean into that a little bit more. I, I, I think freedom is still achievable. I, and, I, and I think you can't take that time back, but you, you can start to almost revive your soul. You revive that connection to yourself and, and, and build that trust again um, because – like I said, your mind likely had it hasn't changed s- since the time that you decided not to go with your convictions. They haven't changed. It's just maybe your confidence has lessened in your ability to bet on yourself or to go with those convictions. But if they're still true, that means that you still have some of your soul and it can be regenerated, in my opinion, but it takes momentum. It takes like consistently trust in yourself and in, in, in making those small choices um, when they come up. Yeah, man, I, I really like the angle you just took on it, how because I, you know, I talked about how when you live in a cowardly way, you kind of die by giving up pieces of your soul. But then you pointed out an additional layer to that death. There is the death of selling your soul, and then there's the death of realizing that you sold it for fool's gold, that the thing you thought you were going to get in return for your soul wasn't even the freedom that you were fantasizing about to begin with. And that's kind of like a double death, right? Because you already gave up a piece of yourself, and you say, well, I can live with that little bit of death in exchange for something awesome, but then you don't even get the awesome you thought you were going to receive, and that's just... That just sucks all the life right out of you. You got to be careful about those secret sacrifices. Sometimes we we want to say yes, and we we say no because we think, well, 
they won't accept my answer. They won't like me if I don't go along. So I'm going to make a secret sacrifice. I'm going to deny myself in order to go along with what somebody else wants. And you're hoping that this secret sacrifice you made is going to pay off. But for the people you sacrificed for, they don't know you're making the sacrifice. You're just deciding mm -hmm. to go along with them. They don't know about mm -hmm. this inner monologue that's going on in your head. And one of my favorite quotes, I believe it's from Audre Lorde. She says, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. And so you get caught up in the pattern of making all these secret sacrifices where you do things that you don't want to do because you want people to like you. And then those people don't reciprocate because they didn't even know it was a sacrifice. And then when you say, well, I sacrificed for you, I traded it all in for you. Those people are like, I never asked you to do that. I never told you to sacrifice for me. I might have been just fine had you did what you really wanted to do. And man, that crushes the soul unlike anything else, you know? So yeah, live it, living life in a cowardly way, it just leads to so many deaths and being courageous and saying, no, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is who I am. It seems like it's going to cost you everything, but it's actually the only path in life that can save your soul. That that quote, by the way, uh, before we move on, was from Zora Neale Hurston. Zora Neale Hurston. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Their eyes were watching God. We should uh, we should do an episode on her, man. I think so. I think so. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's go to number three. Don't believe everything you hear. Real eyes, real lies, real lies. Man, don't believe everything you hear. Real eyes, real lies, real lies. <laughs> Reminds me of this saying. Growing up, this preacher used to say, there you go. Believe in your lying eyes again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, don't limit yourself to focusing on what's right in front of your face. Don't base your concept of truth to only the things that you can see in the here and now. What are the things you don't see? What are the things no one is telling you about? What are the things that aren't obvious? What are the things mainstream media is not financially incentivized to talk about? One of the things that we often don't question is the incentive structure behind all of the stories and trends that show up in our news feed as things that demand our attention. Human beings, just like you and I, are the ones who pick these stories. Every single day, there are thousands of stories that happen. There are lots of people that die. There are lots of people that make a lot of money to change their lives. There are lots of people that go through dramatic, tragic conflict. Someone is picking which stories to ignore and which stories to focus on. And you don't have to look at this conspiratorially. You don't have to say the, the stories they're picking all have some evil agenda behind them. But you can say the process of picking which stories to ignore and which stories to focus on may not be a process that fully aligns with your priorities and your principles. And so you have to step back from the stories other people pick for you to focus on and create your own concept of the news and say every single day, I'm going to go out there and look for certain kinds of stories because I have done enough thinking to know the stories that I need to feed my soul in order to go the places that I want to go. And if mainstream feeds me some of those stories, fantastic, that's a win. But if they don't, I'm not dependent on them. And because I can think for myself and I create my own news, I'm able to see through a lot of the things that are distractions, but other people might just be feeding themselves over and over. Yeah, I think that it's a major key to freedom. It's it's a major key that you if that you need to be able to 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 sort out, you know, the truth, uh, the rhetoric from you know what is relevant to you, what is what is in accordance with you? What is going to be able to help you realize, uh, you know, where you're trying to go? I think 
if you know you you have a good quote that i uh i like i like what you say about it is you know attention is like currency if you're willing to spend it on um if you're willing to spend it on anything you will eventually be duped out of everything and you can't you can't just give up your attention freely i and and i think to the degree that you do um you're sacrificing so much and and it kind of goes back to to the quote we we just talked about um about you know dying a thousand times i think to the degree that you you know every day if you're giving up you know pieces of your att- attention uh, you know a thousand times over the course of however long you know th- like that that's that's all stuff that's being sacrificed there's a trade off happening and you might not be conscious of it uh but but there is a trade off of that currency that would otherwise would be applied to to what you're trying to do and you could go so far you know there there's so much more um there's so much more effective ways to spend that currency um, and it's it's easy to, to to not realize that it's easy to get sucked up in the cycle because that's the purpose of a cycle that that's why it perpetuates that's why it's it's constantly going that's why you know 24 hour news you know notifications buzzing and beeping all the time i mean the the onus is on you to be disciplined it's on you um to to decide you know what are my priorities and and i gotta find ways to get in accordance with that otherwise you know you're just gonna get looped up into the cycle and you're gonna look up years will have passed and you might be frustrated with yourself like why am i still in the same position what why 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 are things taking so long you know what what's what's holding me back and if you if you come to the place where you're doing an audit in your life, that is definitely one of the things that you need to look at. Like, what are your consumption habits? How are you spending your time? What are the things that you're feeding yourself? Because that really uh, dictates the speed in which you're able to implement, or you know, you're able uh, to realize your your freedom. If if your attention is getting split and split and split and split of all day long. Um, I think it's unhealthy and I think it, you know, it, it's, it's a disservice to you. It is a disservice to your potential. Yeah, man. So I'm thinking about this last line, real eyes, realize real lies, a real lie. The thing I want to say about that is lies are real. And this seems to be a very difficult thing for a lot of people to bring themselves to believe. But one of the most liberating, time-saving ideas you can never accept is that lies are real. As sad and as heartbreaking as it may be, there are people who live in your world who will lie. Chances are you have already been lied to about many things and you will be lied to in the future. That's not a reason for giving up on life. That's an argument for why you should think for yourself. People often ask, oh, well, why would they lie about that? Why would anybody lie about that? There is a reason to lie about anything. For any given statement you can make, there is an easy to think of reason for why someone would lie about that. There is a reason to lie to you about you being beautiful when you're not. There is a reason to lie to you about you being ugly when you're not. There's a reason to lie to you and tell you that it's easier to get rich than it actually is. There's a, there's a reason to lie to you and tell you that it's harder to get rich than it actually is. There's a reason to tell you, hey, man, go over there. There's something for you. And there's a reason to tell you, don't go over there. There's nothing interesting to see. You tell me a statement and I can easily give you a reason for why in the right conditions with the right person, someone might be incentivized to lie to you about that. And when you realize that lies are real, you start to take responsibility for your own thinking in a different way. It doesn't mean walking around with a chip on your shoulder. It doesn't mean accusing everyone of lying to you without evidence. You still want to demand evidence for everything you believe, including the belief that someone is lying. It doesn't mean you just go around accusing everyone of telling lies and making up things, but it means that you develop a healthy vocabulary of envisioning the different ways that people might be incentivized to conceal the facts from you. 
That's a mature way of thinking about life. Yes, you can smile, you can be happy, you can be inwardly free, you can be an optimistic person because you recognize that it's not anyone else's job to take care of your information needs. There are people out there that make a business out of giving you information, giving you data and saying this and that, but at the end of the day, putting together a coherent worldview that corresponds to reality is your job. Never outsource your judgment to another person. Yes, you can trust other people to give you their insights on things, but even the very act of trusting another person is an implicit act of faith in your own judgment because you're making the choice to let them be the ones to tell you how to think. You gotta take ownership of that process. Lies are real. Develop the real eyes to realize them. <laughs> I, um, it, it, you know, it really actually kind of goes back to this first point too about, you know, the, this whole, um, what did you call it? The, the, the sacred, sacred stubbornness. I, that, 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 that essence is really important too, because to the degree that you compromise on what you know to be true versus what somebody else is trying to convince you that you shouldn't be in the example of Tupac. You shouldn't be a rapper. You shouldn't be talking about these kinds of things. You should be more like uh, this ideal role model or this ideal uh, public figure. You know, you you need to be you need to understand like your impact. You need to understand, you know, how you should be. And I think if you compromise that you don't understand you, you you're, you're I think you're forgoing the fact that your truth is holds weight too, you know, and, and that you should evaluate your truth versus somebody else's definition of truth and what you should do. Because if you just give up the power to them to tell you what you should do and you go in accordance with that, you're sacrificing, I think, your potential um, to spread your inner truth that will also be true to other people. The reason that Tupac is labeled one of the greatest rappers, I mean, again, in a lot of people's eyes, the greatest rapper of all time is not because he decided to rap about all the things that other people wanted him to talk about or that he wanted uh, to get acceptance by the music industry or record labels at that times. And it was all some strategic ploy, you know, to accelerate his music career. That, that, that wasn't why he was deemed this all time, you know, figure it he he got this ways because he lived in such truth such truth and, and and it came through in his creativity and it came through in his music and that truth has resonated with millions and millions of people across the world why not because it was some picture perfect scripted you know song it, it was because it, it really was true it, it came from a place a deep place a sacred place of truth and you can't discount that, you know, if I think it's it's hard to determine when somebody's lying, especially if they're a good liar, you don't know their intentions. And even if they are telling a version of the truth, what why, you know, what, what is the purpose? What is their intention for trying to get you to believe that truth? And I think if you allow yourself to compromise on your truth, you're allowing yourself to compromise on your potential. You're allowing yourself to compromise on your impact. Um, and, 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 and Tupac clearly didn't do that. Tupac really leaned into that. And because of that, you know, he is who he is. He has the legacy he has. Yeah. One of the things I, I take away from his life and, and the way you just talked about it is don't make too much of a deal out of being polished all the time. There is such a thing as being too polished. Sometimes we rehearse the things that we want to say. We rehearse the things that we want to do. We try to make sure that every detail is just right. The lighting is just right. We try to edit out every moment where we stutter or mispronounce something. And I think that shows up on people's radar as, as inauthentic because they know that to be human is not to be polished all the time. Sometimes we lose our cool. Sometimes we mispronounce things. Sometimes our timing is off. Sometimes we're just not on. 
And we have to be able to show a willingness to embrace that part of ourselves. Can you love yourself even when you don't show up as the most polished version of you? And I think for Tupac, he was very adamant about not being the boring one-dimensional politician. I mean, you know how it is. You know how people do. It's like somebody decides they want to run for office, and so they, they try to clean up their history as much as they can. And then they try to act like, you know, they never swore. They never smoked. They <laughs> never had any alcohol. You know, they try to buy out or get rid of all the footage showing them, you know, ever like rolling their eyes when someone else was talking. And it's just such a silly game to pursue a lifestyle that requires you to be this unrealistic, polished, picture, perfect version of you. I would say half the scandals that are out there with icons are about people doing things they have no business doing. The other half is about people who set themselves up for failure by creating a false expectation of them being polished and perfect in a way that they never needed to be and nobody asked them to be. It's definitely the temptation to do that, though. Um, you know, I, I I know a lot of people who creators who put themselves out there um, and the, t the temptation is to show up as the best version of yourself uh, is. And and I think when I, what I mean by the best version of yourself is the most curated version of yourself, the most flawless version of yourself. And I think largely that's the case because we don't want you know, criticism. We don't want negative feedback. We we don't want haters. We don't want people to troll on us because, you know, our, our eyebrow might be out of place or because we studied on a word or, you know, whatever the case may be. I think, you know, there's a lot of fear around showing up as authentic. Um, we live in a culture that is, yeah, that can be hypercritical of, of people, of creators, of, you know, your, your unpolished ideas. Uh, one of the things you also said that I, I like, you were talking about uh, cancel culture and, and you said, you know, if we had some kind of system that showed everybody their true thoughts and, and it was unfiltered and everybody got to see each other's true experiences and, and the things that are going through their head, we'd all look at each other horrified. Like, that's really what you think? You know, and, and, and there would be, I think, a lot of judgment at first, but I think, you know, there would be a, um, a very necessary compassion culture that would develop because you would understand that we're, we're dealing with real humans, that there's not a, a lot of difference between how you are and how I think. Like the, these might be some of the darker things that society shames us for or that, you know, we might not be proud of. But it, it happens. And I think there's a certain level of, I think, compassion and forgiveness that you got to give to other people, but more so to yourself that like you you just got to be, you know, and, and I think it's it's interesting because we're moving into a space now, at least in terms of creativity, that everybody has, you know, a, a phone, everybody has more access to the tools to be able to create and the audience, the audiences are changing. They want more authenticity. They want, uh, and they connect with that. I think we we naturally do as humans. We know we're not perfect, so we connect with the people uh, who say things that are real. Um, even even in politicians, you know, a, a lot of people have said that about Trump. That you know, the reason I like this guy is because he. He, you know, he speaks truly like that. That a lot of people felt that 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 he's not just some politician. He's not, you know, chasing some, you know, agenda or, or challenging some agenda. So whether he is or he isn't, that's not what I'm here to talk about. But th it's that the outsider like phenomenon. That, that people like the outsider. It's the uh, people like that. Um, so the point just illustrates to lean into that, you know, to, to not be the most curated version of yourself, the, the, that curated version of your curated version of yourself is not the most effective version of yourself. It's just a version that you think will be received in the best way. Yeah, and I'll give you the other side of the political spectrum just to illustrate that this actually does go both ways. When Barack Obama was running up against Hillary, 
a lot of people respected and trusted her more because of this loyalty that they had to the Clintons, including people in black communities, before he really you know, built up a lot of momentum. And one of the things that allowed him to build up momentum is he, he represented himself as not being of the establishment, right? Like he represented change. Um, and he adopted that rhetoric of change, something different. And it just goes to show you whether it was Obama's campaign or Trump's campaign, people tend to reject what is not part of their on their side of the political spectrum. But when you look at the people that were fans of that part of the political spectrum, they did tend to gravitate towards the one that said, hey, I'm different. I'm not that same old polished, you know, working for somebody else, you know, hired gun kind of thing. People do respect that. You know, and, and another thing, too, and, and I actually quote you on this. You, we were talking about, um, I forget the topic, but you said something to the effect of if you act like you need to be nice all the time and like you're a person who never loses their cool, the moment you stand up for yourself and, and say something disagreeable that is totally right and needs to be said, people won't even hear you. They'll just be like, whoa, like what happened to him? Right. And, 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 and they will treat your honesty as if it's this really big scandal. And it's not because what you said was wrong. It's because it's so dramatic compared to the way that you represented yourself. Man, one of the reasons why I tried to create so much when I started blogging every day, this was my reason why. When I started recording a lot, it was my reason why is because I wanted to put myself in spaces where it is physically impossible for me to be polished all the time. If I only have to write whenever I feel like it and you give me a month to write something and then I get to review it and have somebody else edit it, yeah, I can be polished. I can be polished all the time. But if I got to show up every day and hit the publish button, if no matter what, every week I got to record, no matter how hard I try, I just can't be polished all the time. How many times have we laughed at ourselves because one of us was on a riff and the other person was like, yeah, baby, you going. This is going to be a great highlight clip. And then it's like, ah, oh, you, you lose it on that last word or you lose it on that last <laughs> sentence. And you just got to laugh at yourself because that's life. You know, but if you don't make room for that, then you turn it into a scandal for you to be able to ever have flaws. And you don't want to set yourself up for a kind of life where being flawed is such a scandal that people dismiss mm. you as a fraud. Mm. Mm. Hey, man, we're at time, brother. I enjoyed this conversation. I want to come back for a part two and get into a little bit more. Um, you game for that? Yep. All right, Definitely. man. For those of you who are listening, be sure to hit the like, hit the subscribe. Uh, let us know in the comments any questions or thoughts that you have. And be sure to share this episode with a family member or friend, anybody that you think might benefit from it. We appreciate y'all tuning in to the live stream. Don't forget to individualize the revolution in your own life. Peace.